So a couple of weeks ago, I came into this interesting looking uh, receiver that you see in front of you. It's a regenerative receiver. Basically, uh, it's sort of a steampunk approach to a regenerative receiver. I actually did a short video on it to uh, kick off the week, and I wanted to do a long format video. It's probably going to take two videos to go through this receiver, figure out what's inside, suss out a schematic so that we understand uh, what they were thinking when they built the radio. Part one will be kind of figuring it out. Part two will be building up uh, power supply or battery packs and we'll be able to work with the receiver. Now the first thing, this receiver is built out of sheet copper. So it's completely shielded. And the only thing outside are, you know, the interfaces and the plug-in coil is outside. Isn't that clever? This is an amateur receiver. This is not a shortwave receiver. It's not a broadcast receiver. It's not a thrill box. It is a dedicated, it's a dedicated ham receiver. And the plug-in coils are all marked 80, 40, 20, and so on. Uh, you can tell it's a ham receiver also because when you look inside, you can see that they have both a band spread and a band set capacitor. And that's one of the telltale signs that this thing was made for just tuning the amateur bands, very, very narrow portions of the amateur bands, so that you could get fine tuning. So I think you're going to find this a very interesting video because this regen uses battery type tubes. Uh, the first uh, generally available battery tubes to amateurs, of course, show up in the 20s, but uh, by the mid 20s to late 20s, we start to get to more of the commercial large volume type tubes like the 230. The 230 is a, a battery tube that uh, has a 2 volt filament and only requires 60 milliamps. So that makes a fully portable radio like this possible. This guy, the batteries live inside the box. Half of the uh, box is the receiver and half of the box is for the batteries. So if you want to talk about parks on the air or total portable operation, that's what you're looking at here. Except I would place this around 1930 to 1935 as far as the, uh, the date of manufacture by the amateur. So we're looking at an early 30s ham band regen receiver. Here are a few other features of this receiver that clearly put it in the ham radio category and out of the general experimenter Hugo Gernsback shortwave listener category. Notice that it's using high quality variable capacitors and that the main tuning capacitor is on the small variable. This looks like it's possibly a 30 picofarad variable. Having that small range is another sign that this is just tuning a small band with good band spread for ham radio use. This capacitor over here, however, is the larger band set capacitor. This is the capacitor that gets you to the edges of the band. So you might set it here for CW and you'd have full CW band tuning. And you might set it here for the phone portion with full band spread. That's typical uh, clever construction for a ham radio receiver and not as much for a shortwave receiver. The sockets that are inside, I've removed the tubes. These sockets, and I don't know if you can see this, they are spring-loaded flexible sockets. That's a technique uh, to reduce um, microphonics in regenerative receivers. Both tube sockets are floating spring-loaded sockets so that the tubes uh, don't uh, pick up mechanical resonances. Uh, it reduces microphonics, so that's very useful for CW reception. Uh, some other features uh, beyond the, the shielding itself, notice that the plug-in coil is external to the box. This is another clever trick not seen today. Uh, this is the phone jack down here. We have an antenna and ground terminals which were stolen off looks like 1920s radios. So the parts themselves, even the filament rheostat, all of these parts were available generally in the late 20s. That's not a problem. 
but based on you know the kind of rubbery wire they used and and the type of components and the fact that this is sophisticated tells me it's probably something from the early 30s so that's where I place the receiver so next uh, let's look at some of these little tags in here and I can see that these tags are marked A, B, and C so these are the various voltages that went into the battery system over here that's right this is a portable receiver it's not just a ham receiver it's a portable ham receiver think of this as parks on the air portable self-contained totally uh, receiver so you could take this to camp with you and you'd have full shortwave reception and with that battery pack taking up exactly half of the room in the box we call that the 50 50 rule 50 percent batteries 50 percent rig we follow that rule pretty much today. You'll notice that your battery pack is approximately the same size as your rig. This receiver follows that 50-50 rule. Uh, what else can we see? Uh, the detail with the Scotty dogs with his chain. Uh, this again is uh, uh, tells you that this was a ham operator and probably not a professionally built receiver. So we've got our regen control here, I believe. We have our band set over here, our mean tuning, and the filament control in the back. I think everything is there. So this does not use throttle. I don't think it uses throttle for the regen control. I believe it's a, a regen pot. We'll see how that works. What else? Oh, I see a choke and a transformer. So this guy is complete. Let's see if we can uh, come up with some voltages and fire this thing up. But first, let's investigate the tubes they used. Remember, this is a portable radio. It has to use low current tubes. So some of you might be familiar with the Type 30 triode. And here is the ST base, the common uh, ST base. This style of uh, construction on the Type 30 battery triode is uh, late 30s vintage. However, the tubes that came out of this radio are the older globe style. So these would be closer to 1930. Um, the tube itself was developed in the late 20s, but uh, it was actually first in production in 1930. So when you think of the Type 30 tube, 1930 is when it came out. So, again, I place this radio in the early 30s, early to mid 30s, simply because that's the tube it's using. It can't be something that was built in the 20s with these tubes. So the next thing we need to do is test the tubes. Let's go over to the tester and see if these tubes survived all these years. Read the meter. Ooh, it's good. Okay, the first tube is good. I love that. Let's try the second one. Okay, we'll let that warm up for a minute. It's amazing how vacuum tubes last. As long as you don't smash them or vibrate them too much, drop them, they will maintain their vacuum and they'll be good. They'll last a lot longer than almost any other component in your radio, believe it or not. People say that's the weakest component in your radio. Well, it's not. It's really the strongest component because it's in a vacuum. Things don't go bad when they're in a vacuum. Okay, this thing's not very stable, but let's read it. Oh my God, it's really good. Okay, there is no doubt that both of those tubes are good. So when you're trying to figure out a circuit from scratch, uh, it's a good idea to have a schematic in mind that you can cheat with. Uh, it gets you started, gets you thinking about what was done at the time. And uh, I looked around and I found a schematic that used Type 30 tubes. And this particular schematic is later. It's late 30s. It's 1938-39 uh, style 
battery uh, regen. But it uses the Type 30, so I thought this would be a good one to look at, as opposed to looking at like a 1950s twin plex or something like that that might use more modern circuits. I wanted one that used circuits from the 1930s. So here we can see that uh, they are using a trimmer capacitor, but they have a, a primary coil and a secondary and a tickler. So that's later 30s thinking. We know that this simple regen that we have just uses the trimmer connected directly to the top of the, uh, of the uh, secondary coil. Also notice the large value choke that goes to the top of the transformer. This uh, receiver also uses that technique. There's no capacitor at this point. It's a large value choke going to the top of the transformer and they are using a throttle capacitor by this time. They realize that controlling regeneration through you know the plate voltage or some other means swapping out the tickler coil certainly works but a throttle capacitor is a superior way to uh, control regeneration whereas the solder receiver we know there is no throttle capacitor. Uh, they're using a 1 to 5 audio transformer for a step up to the output stage and uh, it looks like they're running the regen on 22 volts and they're running the audio amplifier on 45 volts getting the best out of both tubes the regeneration is much smoother on lower voltage the audio amplifier works a lot better on higher voltage so uh, there's some sophisticated uh, things going on here these are two volt tubes. Uh, they're both hooked in parallel and uh, they have a rheostat in series so they they can control them uh, and starve the stages to again make the regeneration a little smoother by running the filaments at a little lower value. So this is a starting point and I got I got used to this schematic. So let's see what I actually found. Okay here we are and I'm calling it the Scotty regenerative for the first time in this video because of the little Scotty dogs we have on the front. So the Scotty regenerative uh, simply uses a trimmer right to the top of the secondary coil. It has both the band set and the band spread capacitors and notice they have the grid leak going to ground rather than across C3. Okay. They have a fixed capacitor for setting the feedback and they're using a high value a choke going to the transformer. So now I'm rethinking this. Perhaps this is more like 10 or 15 millihenries and not 50. I have to measure that. That was the guess I took based on the physical size. Again, this is a working schematic, not the final schematic. I also guess that this was a 1 to 3 transformer, but we'll have to measure that and see what it actually is. If it's 1 to 5, even better. Uh, the regen control is handling the voltage to the stage, so we're varying the plate voltage with the regenerative control. This is a uh, less desirable form of regenerative control, but that's what they're using. Here's something that's better than what they did with that other uh, radio. They actually have a C battery involved where they're biasing the output stage properly uh, with a C battery. So this is, I think, a better circuit than what they had in that late 30s uh, receiver. The phones are connected directly into the B+. Plus. And again, the B+, plus is probably 45 volts on this receiver. But they add this uh, radio frequency choke in the plus lead to the audio amplifier. I've never seen that before. That's something new for us. Also, they're... Uh, controlling the radio on off by simply cutting the filament and they put the positive filament voltage to ground and to turn it on you ground this and they've got the two filaments in series never seen that before <laughs> learning a lot of new things with this receiver that means that the A battery could be anything between 4.5 and probably 6 volts um, this is very clever. Instead of 2 volts, we can use a more conventional uh, 4.5 or 5 volt supply 
of course the filaments are in series so if you remove one tube it turns the set off completely so this might not look like it's the normal regen that you're used to seeing so maybe there are some things done here that look a little different than than we're used to looking at um, so it's not quite conventional but I think that uh, everything that's done in this receiver makes sense and I think it's going to work very well so let's see what we've got this is the preliminary schematic for the Scotty regen okay I think that was a good start um, I've got the schematic somewhat figured out let's consider that a preliminary schematic there's definitely repair that needs to be done inside and I've got battery packs that I'm gonna to have to build up after I do the initial troubleshooting but I think it is a viable regen I think we're going to be successful with this and uh, stand by for part two where we try to actually get this radio working